Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by our solutions engineering team. Today we will discuss how to use HashiCorp Vault to securely deliver secrets to applications when we often run into that chicken and egg scenarios. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today. Teddy is a senior solutions engineer at HashiCorp. Teddy is going to introduce how authentication in Vault works, give an overview of the app roll auth method, and explain how it integrates with Terraform and Chef. Next, Teddy will go into a live demo and then answer questions from all of you. I also want to note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, usually within a day or two. I'll email it out to all of you. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Teddy. All right, let me uh, unmute myself first. Let me figure out how to change presenter. Um, okay, I think I'm presenting now. Perfect. So. Let me share my screen. Screen two. All right, so hopefully you're seeing my slide deck right now. Um, let me just put it in presentation mode. Perfect. All right. Um, okay, so um, we're here. My name, first of all, my name is Teddy Sakalowski. I'm a senior solutions engineer here at HashiCorp. Um, and the webinar today is going to be about a uh, secure introduction, uh, specifically about using Vault's app role authentication method um, and using Terraform and Chef to kind of uh, help put all that together. Um, little information about me. I've been a senior solutions engineer here at HashiCorp for um, about a year now. It's been a really fun ride so far, really uh, great team and, and a lot of great uh, products. So i um, really happy to share some of this information with you. Um, and I also have the link to the demo repository that I'll be using uh, towards the end of this webinar. So let's go over agenda real quick. Um, firstly, I'm, I introduced myself already, so that's taken care of. Um, just a preface, um, the webinar is going to have a lot of conceptual material. Um, the demo part itself is going to be pretty short because ultimately when, you know, April just works and, and it's a pretty simple thing to, to get to work. But um, the more important bits are going to be the actual source code, what's happening in the background to make everything uh, come together. So I'll spend a lot of time looking at that. Um, where I'll start off is actually um, kind of talking about a blog post that Seth Vargo had uh, and, and a webinar that he had put together. Um, I think in 2016, that kind of talks about different integration patterns between Chef and Vault. Um, there are some missing pieces there, so I'm going to want to kind of close the loop with that, and AppRoll is, is a part of that. Um, and kind of then, then just building the story, adding uh, the proper context to understand AppRoll, specifically around understanding how authentication in Vault works in general, um, building up to the idea of secure introduction, um, in general also. And then finally learn um, about app role and different patterns uh, and how ultimately it helps with the concept of secure introduction. So let's get going. Um, so I mentioned uh, back in February 2016, uh, Seth Vargo uh, used to be a, a developer, director of tech, technical advocacy here at HashiCorp, wrote a really good blog post kind of talking about uh, integration patterns with Chef and Vault. Um, if you've ever Googled, how do I use um, Vault with, with Chef, you'll likely have come across this and you've read through it and you understand um, at a high level the different types of patterns that are available. But even in the blog post himself, uh, Seth mentions that there are some missing pieces that he doesn't cover, namely about the, the story around authentication. So this webinar is going to kind of focus around closing that loop. Um, highly, highly recommend if you haven't seen the webinar or the blog post yet, definitely go through it. It's really going to help add uh, a bunch of additional context here. Um, so let's talk about authentication. Um, ultimately, what AppRoll aims to solve is, is providing a way to authenticate in a secure manner. Um, Vault is I'm going to assume everyone has some concept of what Vault does. Uh, ultimately, it's around centralized secrets management. Um, we have static secrets that you know might live in our uh, in the encrypted KV store. We might have dynamic secrets, which are kind of our um, 
just-in-time on-demand credentials for like databases, AWS API access keys, um, and um, you know, and providing a programmatic way to access those secrets. Um, with with the current trends in modern application development and and cloud-centric everything, um, all of our things are essentially uh, you know very dynamic and very distributed, um, or at least you know we hope that they are. Right, we, we're trying to address a level of scale that's um, increasingly increasingly growing um, and very heterogene heterogeneous. So the idea here is well, we can't we can't and continue to depend on humans to deliver these secrets. We're inherently uh, not the most reliable uh, creatures out there. Um, and more importantly, we can't scale to, to the, you know, to the way that we're doing things currently. Um, so we need a programmatic way to do this. And this is, this is kind of what Vault provides. Um, so we have, we have our secrets, they're all living in Vault. Um, and now we, we need a way to get them. And obviously, as, as a client, whether I'm a human client or a programmatic, uh, let's say a machine, an app, or a container, uh, I need a way to prove I am who I am to, to our vault server, to authenticate, um, and, and get what I need out of it, right? Uh, vault provides a lot of different authentication approaches, whether we're talking about human-oriented ones like LDAP or AD integration or Okta or whether we're talking about programmatic access like uh, our AWS authentication backend, Google Cloud authentication, whatever authentication backend we have in Vault, um, ultimately maps down to the issuance of a token. And this token is what essentially we have policies attached to, and that's our, uh, um, our authorization part, right? Um, and there's more nuance there, especially when we start talking about identity and Sentinel. But for the sake of this conversation, policies are attached to the tokens. And the, the tokens are essentially what we provide with every subsequent API request uh, or operation that happens thereafter. Um, so if I'm a web application and I want to pull uh, a database secret from Vault, um, I need to provide that token to, to allow me to do so. Um, so, with all that in mind, um, we're talking about auth uh, authentication uh, and we're talking about the delivery of a token. The question then becomes, how do we securely deliver these authentication tokens to our programmatic clients, right? Um, the story around humans is pretty easy, right? We log in with the username and password, we get a token and we do something with that token. Um, but how does an application do this, or how does a container do this? Um, and, I'll, and, and how do we get that programmatic entity uh, their token? And this is ultimately the challenge that we're trying to solve. Um, and we're using the concept of secure introduction to solve it. So what is secure introduction? Um, small little aside over here. Um, I have a link over here to a talk that our uh, lead vault engineer, Jeff Mitchell, uh, gave, I think it was last year at a HashiConf, um, specifically around managing, uh, actually, no, I think it was a year before, but it's about managing secrets in a container environment. Um, so although the title sounds like it's really geared towards containers, um, his approach is really a, a really good approach around building the entire context around secure introduction, uh, starting from, you know, uh, your, your security principles that you want to adhere to uh, and kind of providing the patterns that, that can be used. So uh, I highly, highly recommend also watching that, that talk um, to add additional context here. Uh, part of my goal here is to provide, you know, not only my content, but bring in, loop in all the other things that kind of add additional context. And that's a very, uh, very good talk. Um, so back to secure introduction, right? Uh, I want to securely deliver that first secret, that token that applications or containers or servers can then use to pull what they need to do what they need to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that Vault has a number of different authentication capabilities. Um, we're kind of, uh, we're really becoming a, a de facto broker of cloud identity. Um, and I have a link here on the slide, you'll see uh, kind of talking, um, pointing to a blog post that um, our uh, illustrious leader, Armand, um, 
put together talking about this concept um, with, with some additional context at, that I that I think will be super, super informative for folks. Uh, but the idea is that we have a number of different authentication approaches, and a lot of them are built off of the native uh, authentication and identity capabilities within the different cloud providers. So for example, uh, let's take the AWS authentication backend. Um, every, every EC2 instance, and, and this is a simplified um, kind of description, but uh, gives a lot of good context. Um, every EC2 instance uh, that's deployed into Amazon uh, has has a metadata service internally built into it with a lot of different pieces of information along with a cryptographically signed um, identity document, right? Uh, so I might know that I have a specific instance profile attached to the EC2 instance. I might have, I know obviously what VPC I'm, I'm located in. Uh, I know what AMI ID I'm, that was used to build this instance. There's a lot of pieces of information. Um, and that cryptographically signed identity document is essentially a way that I could trust uh, trust that EC2 instance. We, we trust that AWS knows what they're doing and that they have uh, signed this document and that we could use that as a source of, of trust in, in a sense. Um, so the story there is super simple. Uh, the EC2 instance essentially does a, um, a login request, an authentication request against Vault, presents that cryptographically signed uh, identity document. Vault then verifies that against the AWS APIs and says, yes, you are who you say you are, here's a token. And now that that EC2 instance can do whatever it needs to do, uh, whatever that token permits. Um, really easy, simple story um, around the idea of securely introducing that token. Uh, and we have a number of other authentication backends that do similar things. Um, we have something similar for Google Cloud. Uh, there's a Kubernetes authentication backend that helps deliver tokens to pods. Um, again, the idea here is that we, we, we don't want to be a source of identity, but we're brokering all the existing uh, sources of identity that are out there um, as a way to, to be cloud agnostic and deliver these secrets across multiple platforms. Um, but, you know, there, there may be some um, limitations there, right? So I talked about the EC2. Uh, authentication. Um, I might have multiple services running on my EC2 instance, um, or I might be running in a private cloud on-prem where I don't have that authentication capability. Um, any number of potential reasons um, that that may not be enough, or I might need to get more fine-grained. Um, we do have However, most more likely than not, a number of different systems that are involved uh, to, to deliver our applications, right? Um, we, we essentially have what's called a circle of trust. Uh, and Jeff Mitchell talks about that in his talk. Um, but we have a number of systems in our environment that are ultimately responsible for helping deliver our application. Um, we might use Kubernetes, for example, for container scheduling or orchestration. Or we might use HashiCorp Nomad. Um, or both even, uh, we have a lot of cases of, of that, right? Um, we might be using Terraform for provisioning our infrastructure. <clears throat> um, we'll, we'll certainly have some semblance of configuration management, whether we're using Chef, Ansible, Puppet, you know, insert whatever other configuration management tool you prefer. Um, and more likely than not, we'll also have some kind of CI CD pipeline. Uh, Maybe I'm using Jenkins to build a Packer image that then gets deployed using Terraform, um, but it uses Chef to kind of do the configuration management, right? So, so you see the pipeline here, you see how things kind of mix and match. Um, and so we have this circle of trust and we trust these systems to do things. Um, so maybe we could use that, right? Like if we're already using these things, maybe we, we can use these uh, to provide some sort of uh, secure delivery of our tokens. But um, the question then arises, how much do I, or should I trust any of these systems, right? Um, I might really trust my whole chef server infrastructure, for example. Uh, I might believe that there are gonna be no bad actors and I could, I could give chef a fairly privileged token to pull database credentials, let's say for a web application that it's deploying. Um, I might do that. And if that's the case, certainly 
absolutely do so. It's a valid, it's a, certainly a valid um, pattern, but it doesn't necessarily uh, speak to the to the concept of least privilege, right? Um, in security, we want to try to reduce the links in this chain of trust, or at least reduce the amount of trust that we put in any one system. Um, but what, so what do we do, right? Um, I, I have these tokens that I need to deliver, but I wanna try to reduce the amount of trust that I have in any one of these systems. How, how, can, I, how can I solve that, right? Um, and really it comes down to this. I mentioned that there are likely at least two of these types of systems involved in delivering an application in your environment and whatever environment that might be. Um, and I went back a slide just so you see some of these different systems again, right? So at least I have at least two of these systems going uh, running in, in my environment. Um, and what if I had a way now to, instead of delivering an actual token, um, itself to my application what if what if i had a way to distribute a piece of, a, of an authentication uh to my application uh where that that one part by itself doesn't give me anything other than just a piece of an authentication and ultimately that's what app roll allows us to do <clears throat> so let's talk about app roll what is it um an analogy I like to use um, that that helps me at least is is kind of thinking about the concept of April as a username password uh, metaphor, uh, but for machines, right? Ultimately, we're we're splitting up the authentication uh, operation or the delivery of a token essentially to to through two different pieces. Um, we have a role ID, which is a static identifier that basically it identifies our role. So we create an app role. Let's say we're creating an app role for a, a web application. Um, and that web application is going to be deployed over a cluster of nodes. <coughs> um, every one of those nodes will share that same role ID because ultimately that's how we identify what the role is for, the, for this app role authentication. It's not considered a sensitive or secret value. Um, meaning I could, I could embed it into my AMI as an environment variable. I could check it into GitHub along with my app code. I could put it in a Docker file as an environment variable. Uh, any combination of those things, um, it's not considered sensitive. It's, it's, it's a static identifier. Um, and by itself, it doesn't give me anything. I can't take a role ID and get a token with just that. I need the other piece, which is the secret ID. Um, and the secret ID is, is a value that is considered somewhat sensitive, uh, maybe even secret, right? Um, the Ultimately though, it should be unique to each client, right? Because the combination of a role ID and a secret ID will result in a, in a unique token. So I wanna make sure that each of my clients, each of my nodes have unique tokens. This, this helps you know, with that, this one-to-one -one mapping between um, a token and a client helps with the whole concept of non-repudiation. Um, and this secret ID might be delivered in more of a uh, kind of on-demand or maybe a just-in-time type of configuration, right? Um, I might deliver it through Chef. Uh, I might deliver it through some other configuration management, maybe as part of my orchestration system, um, et cetera. There's a number of different options, but the ultimate idea is that I'm delivering through a separate channel than the role ID. Um, and similar to the role ID, I can't do anything with just the secret ID. Again, it just is a value uh, without any context in that regard. But the, the fun thing is when I actually bring them together, right? And that's how I, that's how I ultimately get my vault token. So the idea is ultimately um, the role ID and secret ID should only ever exist together on my final target. Um, and then I bring them together and I get a token and now my app or whatever can do what it's supposed to do, um, keeping in mind the permissions, the policies that are attached to that token. <clears throat> so let's kind of really drill this whole idea in with a picture because pictures help a lot, right? <laughs> um, so really just going to reiterate everything I just said. Um, here we have on the left hand side, we have our vault server. Um, a vault admin has presumably already set up the app role, uh, provided the different to created the different limited tokens, right, uh, for each of our trusted systems. Um, on the right hand side, we have our targets. 
these are our you know application servers our applications our containers the thing that actually need that final token and in the middle we have our trusted systems the things that we have some trust in and we you know have in our environment that do things um, and that might be terraform for provisioning jenkins for for ci cd chef nomad kubernetes pcf i mean any any of these different things that sit there to help help us deliver um, our actual value as, as an organization which is um, which is our applications right um, so the thing that I want to drill in with this uh, with this picture is is that April is a pattern um, I'm specifically going to be talking about um, an instantiation of this pattern using terraform and chef um, but by no means do I want to imply that you can only use things like Terraform and Chef to use Appro. Um, but just giving kind of an, uh, an overview of what, what the demo, what's going to happen in the demo once I get to it is um, I'm essentially run, spinning up a Chef and uh, Chef and Vault server. I'm running it on the same server um, just to keep things simple. Um, and I have Terraform doing the actual provisioning of a chef node. Um, Terraform is going to be responsible for delivering the role ID to that chef node. Um, it's basically going to dump it as an environment variable. And I only need now to give Terraform a very limited token that can only pull a role ID from, from my app role definition. And that's it. So I don't have to necessarily be super concerned if I have a bad actor in Terraform and they get that token and they could, wow, they can only pull a role ID from app role. Again, the app, uh, the role ID by itself can't do anything. Similarly with chef, I'm going to give my chef server a very limited token that can only pull a secret ID. I'm going to put it in a, in a data bag. Um, chef provides a lot of different ways uh, to kind of secure pieces of information uh, with their own pros and cons. Uh, so I might have, you know, a, a data bag, which essentially stores things in plain text. Um, I might use an encrypted data bag or I might use chef vault. When I start talking about the more secure methods of, of those storage options, I this is kind of where I run into the whole chicken and an egg concept, right? If I want to use an encrypted data bag, I have to provide a secret and, to my chef client, and how do I protect that secret, right? Um, but if I'm using a limited token that can only pull a secret ID from Vault, um, I kind of insulate myself from that. I could use a more simpler approach to storing that token and Worst case scenario, if it gets compromised, um, I'm really only pulling a secret ID, which again, very limited functionality, right? So let's go into a demo. <clears throat> so for the demo here, like I said, the demo, the actual demo part is gonna, it, it's pretty quick. It's, I'm gonna run a Terraform um, apply and it's gonna just work. Um, and I'm gonna do that now actually, just to get that started. But the more important bits are gonna be what happens behind the scenes. And I'm gonna take some time to kind of, to, to walk through that. Uh, let me just confirm this. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that there's a repository where this demo will live. Um, the engineers here at, at HashiCorp have uh, started to put together a, a guide of, I mean, a repository of different guides for Vault and, and for our different products um, to kind of help users learn the different features that are available and how to apply them. And this is where this, the uh, secure introduction demo uh, is going to live. Um, and what I'm doing here is uh, basically I have a readme that talks through the setup of everything. Um, one little segue I'm going to mention here. I do also include a number of references in my README, um, talking about the blog post and webinar from previous, talking about Jeff Mitchell's talk, and a number of other things that kind of help with uh, with this whole concept of, of app roles, specifically around Chef as well. So I highly recommend looking through it. So let's let's see what we have going on here then. Um, so. The first, essentially the demo here um, gets provisioned in two phases. I mentioned that I have a Vault and Chef server where I kind of do my initial setup for, for the app role. Um, and I, uh, I, I, I set up the Chef data bag. Let me actually 
increase the size of the fonts here just to make sure everyone can read. Uh, da, 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 da. So I'm not going to dig into the actual provisioning of that, that server too much. Um, it, it's fairly simple. What I will talk about actually is how we set up our app role, because that's the more important piece, right? Um, so once I have Vault up and running, I've initialized it, I've unsealed it. Um, I now want to create my app role. Um, so if we if we kind of look back at the slide I had with the picture over here, I'm almost starting backwards where I define what I ultimately want to be delivered. Uh, and then I kind of fill out the pieces to the left. Um, so we create our app role. Um, the first part of that is what is the policy? What do I want that ultimate token to be able to do? So I have to define a policy around that. Um, and I'm using the API calls here just because more likely than not, those are what you'll use in any type of automation. So I wanted to provide that as an example. Uh, but essentially I have here um, a policy that I'm defining. I'm basically right, I have a secret that's written to my secret slash app one KV backend. Um, again, this, this path is arbitrary. It's where, whatever you ultimately want to read from, um, in vault. Um, and then I have a capability, uh, the capabilities that I want to define for the, the ultimate app role token that will be delivered. Uh, more likely than not, this is going to, going to be delivered to an application. So the, the, the trend is usually, um, applications are the readers and the human admins are the writers, um, or some combination of that, right? So in this case, I'm providing a token that will allow my application to read or list the values in my secret slash app one uh, path. Um, that's writing the JSON for, for the policy. And then now I'm actually writing the policy to vault with this curl command. <clears throat> I'm passing the, the JSON file as the data and I'm naming essentially the, the path that I write it to is the name of the policy that's going to be used within Vault, which is app one secret read. All right, great. So we've defined our policy, right? Now I want to actually apply the policy and create a role uh, within my app role authentication method. Um, to do that, I first need to enable the app role authentication method. And the enabling action is, is very simple. I just give it um, you know, a description and a path where I want to mount it to. And that's what's happening here. Now the fun part. Um, now is where I actually configure the app role itself. So I've defined my policy. I've enabled my app role uh, authentication uh, method within Vault. And now I want to create an actual role within that authentication method. Um, and this is this is you know a, a subset of the configuration items that can be set, but it gives a very good um, overview of the different pieces that can be set. So I have the name of the role. That's self-explanatory, right? I want to call it my app one role. Um, I have a time to live and a number of uses for my secret ID. So Chef is again going to deliver this secret ID to my to its client. Um, I could put some additional restrictions around on that secret ID um, to kind of add additional layers of security. So I could make sure that that secret ID can only be used once. So even if someone somehow manages to intercept the delivery of that secret ID, if they use it, that uh, counter will essentially set to one. And then if any, if my actual client tries to use it, they'll get an invalid token error. And I might use that for some kind of active uh, alerting or something, for example. If I get this error within the TTL of that secret ID, it means maybe it was intercepted at some point. Let's do something about it. Um, then I have the actual token uh, parameters that I want to set, right? I have a time to live for the, the token that's going to be delivered after the app role authentication. Um, and the max TTL. And the difference there is, you know, ultimately how many times can I renew it uh, ultimate to the max TTL of that, that token. Um, and how you configure these values is ultimately gonna depend on the life cycle of the client. So, if I have a fairly immutable infrastructure and maybe I'm rebuilding everything, um, weekly or, you know, every 30 days or something like that, I'll set the token values, uh, in an appropriate manner, uh, that basically maybe will give me some leeway, but might be within that time frame. 
Um, if I want the role ID and the secret ID to live more in a more persistent manner on my client, um, I might give the secret ID a, a longer time to live and a higher number of uses. Um, it's really kind of the, the question around, am I using more immutable or more persistent type of resources and what the life cycle is there. Uh, but you have a lot of flexibility, ultimately, how, how you do that. Uh, so this is, again, just kind of creating the JSON file with the configuration. And then, again, I just do the curl uh, command to write that. Um, and I'm writing, out to, writing it out to my app role role, which I'm calling app1. All right, great. So now I have my app role configured. Um, the next step is going to be to con configure the, the tokens uh, that I want to give to Terraform and Chef. And again, the goal here is I trust these systems, but not completely. I only want to get, I want to, I want them to play a part in the delivery of a token, but not have the capability to pull a full token. Um, and therefore all the things that that token can pull. Um, so I need to create somewhat limited tokens, right? So again, keeping with the pattern, I need to create policies first that are going to define these capabilities. Um, for the Terraform side, there's actually two policies that I'm writing. Um, the main one is, is the one allowing Terraform to pull the role ID from my app role. Uh, and that's the path that I've, I've, I've kind of have highlighted on the screen right now. Um, everything, everything involved has canonical uh, pathing uh, approaches, right? So I know all my authentication backends are going to be listed under auth. Um, I've called my app role authentication backend app role. Um, and then I've, I've named, given it a name app one, right? I always get the role ID for that specific app role in, under this path. Um, and it's a read operation. So, okay, I've defined a policy now that is going to allow me to only read um, the app role, uh, role ID, and that's it. And I'm writing the policy again using the curl statement. Um, this second policy is specific to Terraform. Um, the way Terraform uses Vault tokens is it actually creates child tokens under it so that, you know, it deletes them once it's done doing whatever it does uh, so that that's never exposed, like in a state file, for example. Um, so that's what this, what this whole policy here is doing. Um, and then finally, now that I've defined my policies, I want to configure a token for, for, uh, that's going to be used to grab this role ID. And that's what this section here is about. So firstly, I'm creating my configuration. What are the policies that are going to be attached to this token that I'm giving Terraform? And those are the policies that I've just defined above. I can add some arbitrary metadata, uh, to the, to the creation of a token, um, so if I want to keep track of, of what that token was, was used for, I could add, like I said, some metadata there. And then the time to live and whether or not it's renewable. Uh, the time to live here, you'll see it's 720 hours, uh, 30 days, I think, essentially. And the idea there is that um, because it's a limited token and it's, it's going to be used by, you know, uh, a, a system in our environment that, that we have some trust in, we could give it a longer lived token so that we don't have to constantly be renewing that, right? Um, if I'm using Terraform Enterprise, I might um, scope it specifically to a workspace, for example, and it'll live there and you know do what it needs to do. Um, and then finally, I'm, I'm pulling that token. Here, I'm writing it out to a JSON file just so I can kind of keep track of it and use it later. And this is what that JSON file looks like. It's, it's the token along with all the additional metadata associated with that token. But this highlighted piece is what I actually give to, to Terraform. Um, the next step is going to be to do that same exact thing, but for, for my chef server and for my secret ID. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I'm, I'm essentially doing the same type of thing. One thing I will point out though, um, if you see the policy that I've defined here, the capability I'm giving it is an update capability. Um, so I keep saying pulling a secret ID from, from vault. Um, but the, the actual operation is a post operation. We're creating that value first and then getting it back out. So that's why you see the difference here between a read and an update, just, you know, heads up on that. Um, but same type of thing. We're defining a policy for the token. It's going to use that policy that allows us to only pull our secret ID from our app role path 
um, and only that. And then I create the token. And um, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to put this in a chef data bag. Well, again, what that looks like is similar JSON file. I have my client token, right? Um, and I'm actually going to dump that entire JSON file, that entire metadata into my chef data bag. So I have some commands here where I'm adding an ID field because uh, data bag items need to have an ID field, but I'm using the same that same JSON file and I'm putting it into my data bag. And ultimately this is what this is what that looks like. Um, so that's really the setup. I, I'm, I'm not gonna actually go through and set all this up in my demo because I've, I've already scripted through that to keep things quick, but I did wanna step through to show you what's actually happening. Um, so this gives us an idea of what I've done to set up our app role. So now let's kind of, let's take a quick look at what's gonna happen in the background. Um, firstly, let's look at our chef recipe because that's probably what everyone's really curious to see is, is all right, how did he actually uh, set it up to talk, talk to Vault? Um, the recipe here is really simple. I'm just running, um, I'm just installing Nginx and creating a custom index.html file that's gonna output these different values. Um, there's, this is a very simple um, illustration, very simple example. There's a lot more you could do with it. And that's kind of where Seth's uh, blog post goes into play. But I wanted to provide a simple entry point and set, set the context, which you can then take and kind of uh, expand on and evolve and mature. Um, ultimately, you'll likely be end up using the, uh, the Vault Ruby gem that we, we support. Um, it makes it super simple to interact with the Vault APIs. Um, and that's, that's re a really simple way to, to kind of do what you need to do in your chef recipes. So this is me just pulling that, that vault Ruby gem, um, installing Nginx and now the important bits, right? Um, so the, the vault Ruby gem essentially exposes a vault client. Uh, I need to give it address to tell it where my, um, vault server actually lives. I've embedded that on my chef node the actual client as an environment variable using Terraform. And I've also embedded that role ID. So here, here's the actual piece where, you know, I, I assume already that Terraform has gone through the process of provisioning my instance using the user data field. I've told it to write the role ID out to, um, to an environment variable. So it's now exists on that, on that server, right? So chef doesn't, my chef server never actually has that piece of information. Um, and then, you know, I'm going through the process of pulling, pulling that, that, uh, token, the token that I'm going to use to retrieve the secret ID from my, uh, chef data bag. Um, I'm going ahead and authenticating with my vault client using that token. I'm pulling the secret ID. And again, I keep saying pulling, but you see here it's create secret ID. That's the whole update mechanism that I, I mentioned earlier, but that's getting my secret ID. And then finally, the really fun part, um, like I said, not super complicated. I'm doing an app role authentication. I bring my role ID that I've pulled from an environment variable um, and the secret ID, which I just pulled in the, the line previously. And I'm doing an app role authentication with this vault client. Um, and that gives me a token that gives my chef recipe that's running local to my chef client a token, uh, which I can then use to read from my secret backend. Uh, I mentioned I wrote some arbitrary data to secret slash app one, um, and I'm using that token to pull from there. And I'm just kind of writing out some information to my, uh, uh, to an index page. So let's see if the demo gods were friendly to me today and if everything worked. And it didn't. All right, awesome. Let's just do another apply. Um, of course that would happen. <laughs> there is a, um, a small bug that occasionally rears its head, and I'm trying to figure out why that comes up. Um, but certainly, if anyone else uh, starts playing around with this and, and comes across it, feel free to pull a, uh, put a PR in for that. Um, but more likely than not, I'm just going to do the reapply, and it'll work. Um, and I'll be able to show you the end result. Um, and this is why I mentioned earlier that the actual um, the actual demo part itself is, is pretty quick because so, it either works or not. Um, I guess while that's running, let me talk real quick about, uh, where was that, about what's happening on the Terraform side.
So I mentioned I'm using Terraform to uh, provision my instance and to pull the role ID from Vault. Um, we have a number of different providers that help out with these types of things. So you see over here, I'm using the Vault provider. Um, I'm passing in the, the Vault um, IP address for the Vault server and the token that I want to use. Typically, you, you probably set these as environment variables, but I'm showing it here just to make it explicit. Um, and the, the, the important bit here is the actual data that I'm put, pulling from Vault, which is the role ID. Um, so that's kind of where, where in the Terraform code I'm pulling that. And the other piece here is the chef provisioner for the instance that I'm, I'm creating, right? So I'm using Terraform to provision an AWS instance. I want to use a chef provisioner to bootstrap that instance with my chef server, which is already up and running. Um, and I want to, I want to provide a run list of the recipes to run when it comes up. And that's what I'm doing here. Uh, really neat feature um, for Terraform to kind of you know do that automatic bootstrapping. All right, let's see again. Wow. Okay, it failed again. This is weird. I ran it five times earlier this morning, and it worked without a problem. <laughs> um, let's go to the README. Um, I'll show you what you're supposed to see ultimately. And then we could kind of go into a Q&A session uh, instead of hoping that this works again. Um, ultimately, what you're supposed to see at the end is uh, provision. You're, I'm basically just getting a web page that shows the role ID, the secret ID, our app role token, and our secrets. Um, really not nothing crazy. Um, but of course, I'm doing a demo, so the demo gods are not friendly today. So I think at that, um, I'll leave it. And um, I think we could go to a Q&A session. And then if this comes up, I could just circle back and show you uh, show you how everything's working. Um, so let's, let's move into that. OK, Teddy, thank you. So uh, the first question, um, someone's wondering if you can explain what it means to wrap secrets. Sure. Uh, that's a good question, actually. I, I didn't go into that. Um, so I mentioned, um, you know, we talked about, let me, let me bring up the, uh, the, the slide real quick. So we talked about, you know, we have this whole um, picture right here. Uh, we're, we're doing, we're providing a role ID through Terraform and we have our secret ID and I might have it wrapped. So an additional layer of security, um, Vault provides a capability called response wrapping. Um, so if I really want to make sure that no one on my chef server can actually get that secret ID, I can essentially, uh, it's kind of like uh, envelope encryption in a way where I'll wrap that secret ID value with another value. Um, and that essentially means that I could, I could only unwrap that value once. So it's kind of like the, the thing I alluded to earlier with the, um, thing where if, if I, if, if that secret ID does get unwrapped and I'm able to retrieve that secret ID, I can't use that, that token, that wrapped token anymore. Um, it's only kind of like a one, one time use thing. Uh, so then if I ultimately deliver that wrapped secret ID to the client and the client tries to use it and they get an invalid token error, I can raise an alarm that something was intercepted along the way. Let's you know inquire what's going on. Uh, so it's just another layer of security um, kind of to, to wrap that whole uh, secret ID um, and give us a way to know that something might have happened along the way uh, in the delivery of that. OK, great. And then um, next question is, um, how could that be integrated with AWS KMS, or is that actually an alternative to KMS? So this is essentially, um, for, for lack of a better way of stating, it's kind of an alternative to KMS, right? Um, one of the approaches here is uh, I want to remain somewhat cloud agnostic, or I might want to implement this pattern on-prem where I don't have KMS. Um, KMS does provide really good capability for um, you know, managing encryption keys and doing you know, decrypt encrypt operations, uh, but this isn't really that, right? This is more of a way to, to um, deploy a secret. Um, and I, I could certainly use Vault in conjunction with KMS, right? I could create encryption tokens 
uh, on a on vault and export them and use them as a CMK in KMS. But we're kind of talking about a different thing here. Uh, this is really really delivery of like you know say I have a database. Um, a database credential that my web app needs to use and it lives in vault and i need a way for that web app to pull it out of vault i need that token um, this is a way to kind of do that um, yeah so so it, it, it's kind of two different things in that regard okay great so then um next person is uh asking that since chef bootstrapping only works with servers um they said they had this kind of solution using cubbyhole how would they do this where something is launching um, their applications for them like Amazon ECS? Sure, okay, that's a good question, right? Uh, so there's a couple different things that, and by the way, the demo actually worked this time. Um, this is what you're supposed to see. Um, so in terms of cubbyhole and you know how I might use something with ECS, uh, there's actually two different things going on there, right? Um, Cubbyhole is is really that whole concept of response wrapping that I just talked about, right? We talked about it in the context of a secret ID, uh, but the idea around Cubbyhole is that I have this wrapped thing, um, and it only has like a one-time use. It has a, a, a spot that we store it in, in Vault, and then once I unwrap that or use that Cubbyhole value, that value is deleted out of Vault. So it's kind of like a one-time use um, wrapping thing. And I could, I don't have to use it only for a secret ID. I could use it as, as part of the delivery of a token, maybe instead of using app roll, right? Um, but the other side of the story here is ECS, right? Um, kind of talking about containers or maybe even, you know, Lambda functions, so on and so forth. Um, you don't you don't necessarily have to use something like April for that, right? It might be part of the story. Um, kind of going back to what I was talking about uh, with the AWS uh, authentication backend, I focused a lot on the EC2 authentication aspect, but there's also um, the IAM authentication uh, capability within AWS, where I could use things like STS and assume role, um, and and the inherent uh, idea that things have an IAM role attached to it in Vault, uh, I mean, uh, in AWS. Um, so that's a pattern that might be used. Or I might even layer different things, right? Um, you know, kind of going back to the EC2 example, uh, I might have multiple services running on my EC2 instance. And yeah, I could use the, I could use the um, AWS EC2 authentication to do something, but I want to have more fine-grained tokens for my services. Um, you know, I might still embed a role ID into my application code or, you know, assuming we're using app role um, into my application code or, or, or even a container or whatnot. Um, and I might use the EC2 or other AWS authentication aspect to to provide the secret ID through that mechanism. Right. Maybe maybe that AWS authentication can only be used to grab a secret ID instead of using Chef. Right. Um, so it's another potential pattern that that's available. So it's really all about you know different patterns. Um, we provide a lot of flexibility, um, you know. And, but I'd be I'd be certainly curious to kind of work through some additional examples, um, you know. Cool. Okay. Uh, next question, Teddy. Um, so they're asking. So uh, how do secrets needing refresh play into the chef like life cycle? So. Um, right retrieving credentials for an SQL backend and those credentials expired, how would the file be updated? Sure, that's a good question, right? So, so for this, I'd actually defer back to Seth Vargo's um, blog post, right? Um, because the idea here is that now, say we have something that has a more um, persistent life cycle that exists for a while. Uh, so I don't want to tear it down, bring it back up and, and give it a new new token. I want to continuously renew something. Um, so I might, you know, the, the patterns that, that Seth talks about in this blog post kind of address the pros and cons of different approaches, right? I took a really simple approach of, of kind of pulling a static value. Um, but if I wanted to manage these um, more dynamic tokens, uh, database credentials, for example, I might use, um, you know, maybe method number two here, I think. Uh, is this two? No, actually method one, sorry. Uh, reading secrets at runtime, right? Um, so instead of Chef um, deploying 
let's say, deploying the actual secret, um, whether it's a secret ID or a token itself, instead of Chef doing that part, um, what I'm telling Chef to do is to deploy the application that might use those database credentials and something like console template. And I'm giving console template um, a, uh, a token to do what it needs to do. So for anyone that's not familiar with console template, um, we have two things, uh, console template and env console, env console. Um, these are sidecar applications that help with managing the life cycle of dynamic credentials in Vault. Um, they're, the naming is a bit unfortunate because they were originally written for console to watch like KV um, uh, paths and, and do things when things change. Um, but they work really well uh, for Vault as well because they, they have logic in it that, that can be used to update um, so like console template, for example, is focused around uh, updating configuration files. So I might, you know, tell console to console template to check this um, this specific path in Vault uh, to grab a token. It's it's aware of the of the um, of the TTL of that token, and it'll know to try to check and renew it at half that TTL, for example. Um, when it renews it, it'll update the configuration file, and then it has an orchestration component that can then kick off my service or reboot my service um, to use that new credential. Um, so, you know, I, I highly recommend looking at this blog post and kind of understanding what goes on there. Um, the webinar here is to kind of try to close that loop um, that we even talk about, he even talks about here at the bottom, the missing pieces of how do I actually do the authentication. Um, and Seth does talk about app ID, which is what um, app role used to be and cubby hole that was brought up earlier. So, so this helps to kind of tie everything together. So hopefully that, that helps answer your question. Great. And just to note to everyone, um, all the links that Teddy has been providing um, to these blog posts and his slides, we're going to include um, with the recording when we post it on our website. So rest assured you can find these links and everything that he's uh, mentioning uh, after and when I send the email to everyone with the link. Um, so the next question, Teddy, um, someone's saying, so they use Packer to bake AMIs so they can run Chef, then bake the AMI, then share that out. Uh, how would you recommend providing the secret ID in that situation? Sure. So. Um Actually, can you repeat that one more time, Amanda? Just I just want to make sure I get all the relevant yeah. bits. There. So they are using Packer to bake the AMIs, um, so they can run Chef, uh, bake the AMI, then share that out. Okay, so I'm gonna. There's two different patterns here, and I'm gonna talk about them. You know, uh, both in real, uh, you know, kind of high level because uh, it's not necessarily clear to me which one we're talking about here, but I get the idea, right? Um, ultimately, we have some kind of a, a process by which we're trying to um, preload as much as we want onto our AMIs. So it might include application code, uh, configuration, so on and so forth. Um, the configuration management piece of it, I might doing a lot of the chef stuff at the Packer um, image creation time, or I might do be doing it um, after I provision that AMI. So you kind of have um, uh, two different phases where you might do configuration management and you might be using both, right? Um, with this pattern, what I'd say is typically if if we're using an AMI per application, let's say, um, I might embed the role ID um, through the Packer process as as uh, an environment variable, or you know maybe some you know some text file in a known location. Uh, but I can embed and embed that into the um, uh, into the uh, AMI. Um, and then if I'm doing a, a Packer run after that AMI has been deployed, you know, maybe I'm doing that post deployment, uh, you know, like a converge or something like that, I might use Chef then to to deliver that that secret ID, um, you know, after it's been deployed to to make it, you know, that one to one mapping with the with the uh, with the application or the uh, the AMI. Okay, um, and next question is, can app role be mapped to AWS IAM roles? Can app role be mapped to AWS IAM roles? Um, so th technically no, right? Because they are, app role is just some construct within, within uh, Vault. Um, however, app role is concerned with the delivery of a token, right? Um, if I want that token to be used to pull AWS 
um, API access keys, right? Like, because we, ha we have a, a secret backend that uh, generates dynamic a AWS API access keys. I can map that token uh, to be able to pull from there. Um, not sure if that's exactly what you're asking. Uh, if you're more concerned about um, using existing IAM roles, for example, on uh, on the AWS side as a source of authentication in, in Vault, um, you might not even have to use uh, app role for that. You, you, uh, I'd highly recommend taking a look at the um, AWS authentication backend and I'll, you know, I'll, uh, AWS auth, I'll bring that up right now, just to kind of give you a really quick overview. Um, it, it alludes to the EC2 authentication method that I talked about earlier, which is kind of the, the first um, uh, way that we did AWS authentication. And that's kind of what this talks about here. But then we also have the IAM authentication method, which is uh, using those IAM roles, those policies that might be attached to, you know, different resources in AWS as a source of that identity. Um, so this kind of goes to the whole concept of secure introduction that I was talking about earlier. If you can use the built-in native authentication capabilities within uh, AWS or Google or Azure, for example, um, I'd certainly try to use them and, and April might just fill an additional need or an additional layer on top of that. Great. Okay. Um, the next question is, and we'll probably take uh, two more. Um, with tools like console template existing, do you recommend that approach over some form of code integrated and vault aware config factory that might handle the removal of secrets? Um, on the answer is yes or no. I mean, honestly, it really depends. So. Uh, in my experience, for example, um, a lot of our customers or potential customers um, want to use Vault in their environment, but they're they're still using, I'll say, quote unquote, legacy applications. And I say legacy because I mean they're not really legacy. We use still use them all the time, uh, but they might be based on um, a configuration file that has secrets encoded in that configuration file. Um, and I can't go through, uh, it, it's a level of technical debt that I have. I don't have the time, money, resources to refactor those applications, but I still want to add an, a layer of security that that I don't have there, right? So I could use console template in conjunction with Vault to you know, update the, the secrets in that configuration file, let's say maybe on a weekly basis or even on a daily basis. Um, the idea there is that console template is going to handle uh, the update of that secret uh, and the configuration file and the restarting of the service. Uh, most breaches um, happen over a long period of time, right? You want to trickle data out, uh, exfiltrate it out slowly so you don't trigger any systems. Um, if I'm changing, uh, you know, a credential on a weekly basis, uh, you know, it, it's providing a good, a good layer of security that wasn't there. That being said, um, if you have the resources and the developers and, and you know, the time to do a deeper integration to my application, um, why not? I mean, it, it's, you know, everything in Vault is uh, exposed to, through the API. Um, you know, you'll have to build in the the capability to monitor the life cycle of a token or a secret and renew it and so on and so forth. So it's a bit of work, but it's a perfectly viable um, pattern as well. And again, that's something that that um, Seth talks about in the blog post as method four, directly integrated into our application. Um, I keep referring back to it because it's an amazing article that gives a lot, you know, the pros and cons of different uh, approaches. So it really depends. You know, I hate to say it, but it depends, right? Depends on your environment. Right. Okay, Teddy. So I think that is all of our time for today. Sure. Um, thank you for answering all those questions from everyone. Um, so great questions from the audience. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. I hope everyone enjoyed today's webinar and you're able to learn a bit more about Vault App Roll. Thank you for joining. And a special thank you to Teddy for his time and expertise today. I also want to mention that HashiCorp is hiring. So if you like what you saw today, please take a look at our jobs page at HashiCorp.com slash jobs. I think there might be a fit for you. And finally, as I mentioned at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website after processing. I will send an email to everyone who registered with the recording link. Um, and I will also include all the links Teddy mentioned and his slide deck with that. Um, you can also keep your eyes out on Twitter for the recording. I'll post it usually a little later today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks a lot, everybody.